Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. Today, I'm going to talk about a topic that I've been sort of teasing for a while and researching for a while. And this is definitely part one of several, but I'm going to be talking about ghosts and ghost stories and hauntings in Astoria, New York, which if you have been listening to the podcast for a little bit, you'll know that is where I live. It's a neighborhood of New York City. It's in Western Queens. And I've done a lot of episodes about Astoria, cemeteries in Astoria, places near Astoria, like Calvary Cemetery, which is in Sunnyside, which is nearby, or Roosevelt Island, which is nearby. And I've talked a lot about the history of the area, but not as much about hauntings in the area. I've found it weirdly difficult to find specific stories about hauntings around here, and I'm not totally sure why that is. It may be that in comparison to somewhere like Manhattan, there's just fewer people here, there are fewer tourists, and there's not as much of a history of Queens being as densely populated as there are in Manhattan, or as there is in Manhattan. So today I want to start out my look at ghosts of Astoria by looking at a ghost that has some presidential ties. This was a really weird story that I was surprised to find during my deep dives of newspaper archives. And then I also want to talk about the ghost that's kind of the most common ghost of the area, with the exception of the ghost train on the Hellgate Bridge, which is right near Astoria Park near here, which I've talked about in my Ghosts of Hellgate episode. With the exception of the stories about the bridge, it seems like the biggest story about a haunting in this area is the White Lady of Astoria. There is a long history of women in white in different places. It's a really kind of archetypal haunting, almost. If you are into paranormal stuff at all, which I assume you are since you're listening to this, you've definitely heard stories about women in white all different places. And I know on this podcast, I've talked about a woman in pink, I think, which kind of fit into that archetype, though she was wearing a different color that was in the context of Asheville, North Carolina. I think I've talked about some sort of women in white type characters in the episodes I did about the Hawthorne Hotel in Salem, Massachusetts. But let's get into today's stories. So the first story today has to do with a former U.S. president named James A. Garfield. I'm going to be honest, I remembered that Garfield was a president, but I didn't remember a lot about him, so I had to look him up. I'm sure a lot of you listeners, even if you are American and even if you did listen in history class like I did, I'm sure a lot of people need a little bit of a refresher on him because he was not president for very long. So for background, James A. Garfield was a president of the United States who was shot by an assassin four months after his inauguration in 1881, and he died two months later. So he was only president for six months, and for a third of that time, he was dying from a bullet wound. I'm not going to get into a ton of detail about his assassination, though one fun fact, I don't know if that's the right word when you're talking about an assassin, but one interesting fact is that the gunman purchased the gun specifically because he thought it would look good in a museum, which I don't know, that's just a nice flourish, I think. And also back then, presidents weren't guarded, like they didn't have the big Secret Service details. And I was reading about it, and supposedly people thought that Lincoln's assassination was just a fluke, right? There was a lot of tension because of the Civil War, etc. And so it sounds like they were like, well, Lincoln, that was just a weird thing that he was killed. We don't really expect presidents to be assassinated, etc. But they were wrong, and Garfield was not guarded. So he was taking the train from Washington, D.C. to New Jersey. And in D.C., before he left, the assassin shot him at the train station. And he never made it to Jersey or to the other places he was going to go. And 
This story is about one of the places he planned to go on that trip, supposedly. I don't know how many other places the story appears, and there's basically just one source for this story, a newspaper man named Eugene Virgil Smalley, who was a friend of President Garfield's. So basically, there was this newspaper man, Smalley, who was notable because he looked exactly like Garfield and he had lots of similar interests. And the two of them ended up becoming friends. So that's already kind of weird, right? Like this random doppelganger newspaper man. They became the best of friends. And I wanted to read a bit from the article about that. The resemblance was not merely physical. They had many habits of mind and sympathies in common, a circumstance among others, which made them warm friends. There was in Garfield's rather poetic temperament a strong vein of mysticism, a fondness for the occult which needed little cultivation to have led Guiteau's victim into paths which other men of great talent and strong imagination have followed until led by them into strange faiths and delusions. Side note here, Guiteau is the assassin who killed Garfield. So, to continue reading... Théophile Gautier said that there is in every man's mind a certain dark chamber where bats of superstition lurk, only needing the right kind of prod to set them fluttering their uncanny wings, obscuring the reason with all sorts of dark shadows and queer phantoms. In the case of Garfield, this dark chamber was large and the door was easily opened if a discreet and sympathetic hand touched the spring. So basically, a smally was this portal for Garfield into occult things, into the paranormal. It wasn't an acceptable interest for a president or a politician to have. So supposedly it was through their friendship that he was able to kind of indulge in these things. So to keep reading. At about the time of General Garfield's inauguration, there was much stir among New York spiritualists over certain strange occurrences said to be taking place in a house in Astoria. The owner of this, a hard-headed businessman who had amassed a large fortune and the distinctly material occupation of making pig iron, had had the misfortune the winter before to lose a very beautiful daughter whom he idolized. She died in Florida after a lingering illness. The shock utterly shattered her father's nerves. He brooded upon his loss until it became the fixed idea of his life. The article goes on to say that the man tried to distract himself with work, but as soon as he got home every day, he felt devastated again. He was reminded of his beloved daughter, who was dead. However, one day he was heading home and he was so absorbed and thinking about something work-related, I guess there's a lot to think about when it comes to pig iron, and for once, he didn't have his daughter on his mind when he got home. So, I'll read a bit more from this article. She was quite out of his mind when he walked into the large front parlor and started to go through the open sliding doors to the rear parlor, the windows of which overlooked the lawn reaching down to the river. And by one of those windows in her favorite nook sat his daughter. So real, so true to life, in every detail of feature and pose was the vision that with his mind for the moment unburdened as it was from the sense of loss, he for an instant felt no surprise at seeing her, where he had seen her hundreds of times before. He advanced a step toward her, whereat she looked laughingly and brightly at him, but held up a warning finger, which brought him to a standstill, with, for the first time, a realization of all that had befallen. So the article continues, saying that he told himself he must have imagined it, he closed his eyes, he rubbed them, he opened them again, but his daughter was still there. However, she was doing something really strange, which I just have to read from this article. It's so bizarre. Both her hands were now busy weaving a curious filmy lace, which rolled slowly to her feet in a sort of fleecy spray, which dimmed and melted out of sight. What the heck is this? Is it like some kind of ectoplasm or what? I don't know. But, you know, he tries to come closer. His daughter raises a finger in warning. And then she keeps creating this ghostly lace. And it seems like whenever she stopped making this lace, she started to dim. 
and fade from view. And when she started making it again, she became more solid. It's almost like she was like weaving her own existence in the universe of the living or the world of the living. I don't know. If anybody knows of similar stories of like a ghost needing to weave or create something in order to stay present in our world, I would love to hear about it because this is so strange and interesting to me. So of course, word of this apparition got out and Smalley heard about it, as did a bunch of spiritualist mediums. Tons of them came and to read a bit more from the article, every night there were seances at the Astoria house. Mr. Smalley was present at nearly all of them for several weeks. He wrote column after column in his New York paper concerning the events at the Astoria house. Each story very striking in its minute simplicity of detail, and quite like a chapter out of Sprite in the delicate beauty of the manifestations. So Smalley becomes more and more interested in this apparition, so of course he mentions the ghost to his friend, Garfield, the president. Garfield wanted to see the ghost, but now that he was president, there was no real way for him to visit. You know, as president, you can't be like, all right, I'm bound for New York to see a ghost that a bunch of spiritualists are excited about. That's just not not how things are done. However, Garfield was about to give a commencement speech at Williams College, and Smalley said that on his way back to D.C., he could just spend a night in New York City and he could come to the Astoria house in secret. So Garfield agreed, all the arrangements were made, a famous medium was hired for the evening, and supposedly Garfield was really looking forward to the visit. His friend Smalley got everything ready, but on his way out of DC, at the train station, Garfield was shot, and that led to his death. And he never got to see this haunted house in Astoria. So it was said that the haunted house in Astoria continued to be haunted. But now, it wasn't just the man's daughter who visited. There were supposed sightings of Napoleon, Shakespeare, and other famous people who fraudulent mediums tended to claim to see. But now the whole host of ghosts was joined by Garfield's spirit, supposedly. I obviously think that part is BS, I think the part about the daughter is interesting. I think the parts about famous people is not believable at all. And I think the Garfield thing is like fun and interesting, but too convenient. But at any rate, the man who lived there continued to believe in ghosts. And these spirits supposedly comforted him and made him feel less alone. And he lived there happily in that house in Astoria until his eventual death. And side note, Based on the description of being able to see the river from the house, etc., I'm assuming that this man lived in what we would call Old Astoria now. So the area near St. George's Church, which I have talked about in previous episodes, and near the Irish Famine Cemetery, kind of that general, general area. So I looked for the articles that Smalley supposedly wrote about this haunting, and I couldn't find anything. I searched through multiple archives. I don't know if these articles were written without his name attached. I don't know if they were written in a newspaper that didn't make it into the archives. I have a lot of questions there. I looked for a long time, and I couldn't find anything. So take this whole story with a grain of salt, but I do find it charming. I think the thing about the ghost weaving something in order to keep herself on this world is fascinating. And I love the idea of a president who was into ghosts. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of American presidents, but this is a fun detail. I did find that there's a lot of stuff online about places that Garfield supposedly haunts, including the Gothic castle that houses his remains in a cemetery in Cleveland, Ohio. So if you're in Cleveland, you can check that out. I feel like his ghost is more likely to haunt there than some house in Astoria that he's never been to, but I'm also sure that it was profitable for spiritualists to claim that Garfield haunted that house, so not surprising. So now let's talk about the White Lady of Astoria. Like I said, stories about ghosts who are women in white are very common. If you go to Wikipedia, there's a huge, long list of white lady ghosts. And just to read a little bit from Wikipedia, 
A white lady or lady in white is a type of female ghost typically dressed in a white dress or similar garment, reportedly seen in rural areas and associated with local legends of tragedy. White lady legends are found in many countries around the world. Common to many of these legends is an accidental death, murder, or suicide, and the theme of loss, betrayal by a husband or fiancé, and unrequited love. And if you go to the Wikipedia page, you can find by country all these different stories and It's definitely not a comprehensive list at all, but it will at least give you a sense of how common this idea of a white lady is. So to acknowledge my main source for this story, there's this great blog that I've talked about before called the Newtown Pentacle. It's run by a man named Mitch Waxman. I've talked about this blog before. It's an amazing resource for anybody doing research in the area. And it's also just a great read because he's a guy who wanders around Astoria and the neighborhoods near Astoria and takes pictures mostly at night. He spends a lot of time near the Newtown Creek, which is the little creek that divides Brooklyn and Queens. That's right by Calvary Cemetery. And he's kind of like an expert on that creek, but he's also an expert on Astoria history. I've definitely talked about his work while talking about hauntings at the Hellgate. And his blog is full of really cool pictures, but also he almost has this Lovecraftian way of writing these blog posts. So it's not the easiest read, but it is like really fun and interesting. So he's lived in Astoria a long time and he has gathered stories of hauntings at 44th Street, between Broadway and 34th Avenue. And that's a block that he used to live on. It's pretty close to a couple different places I've lived in the past, though I have never had any kind of encounters with the white lady of Astoria. But he asked around on his old block and he talked about his former neighbor, who when he asked if he had seen a ghost, he said that there is a ghost that haunted the whole block And it was a lady in white who moved from house to house. And he said that he had seen it, his mother had seen it, his tenants had seen it. And it was just a really well-known haunting among people who grew up on that block and who lived on that block. And they called this ghost the white lady. And if you Google Astoria haunting or Astoria ghost, etc., almost everything you find will be about the white lady. And most of the things about the white lady, Mitch Waxman is credited for. And the stuff he isn't credited for, he should be. I'm pretty sure he's like the guy who made this uh, thing that was known on the internet. So anyway, I wanted to read some of the stories that he recounted on his blog. So this man he spoke to told the story of his mother, like the story that his mother told him. So I'm going to read that. When my brother and I were very small, around two and five or three and six respectively, we both had high fevers and were sleeping in my mother's bed. My mother said she heard someone walk down our hallway and she assumed it was my father as he worked late into the night. She then says she smelled some very sweet perfume and felt someone sit down on the edge of the bed. She was sitting with us watching over us. She never saw anybody, but rather felt a presence. She said she knew it was the presence of a lady with the resonance of the word being someone higher in society, graceful and composed. The presence let it be known to her, how I don't know, that she was there for a good reason, that she was there because she was worried about my brother and I and would watch over us and protect us. My mother added that she thought the lady was the wife of the person who owned the land way before our house was built, but I'm not sure if that was hearsay she might have picked up on in future years. And... Just to pause here, I think that's like an interesting note at the end, this idea that you can feel a presence in a place and you look for answers and you find a story and you superimpose that over this paranormal experience that you've had. And maybe it's accurate, maybe it's not. I think this presence doesn't have to have been a ghost I don't know how religious the people who told this story were, but of course, 
In Catholicism, there are a number of important female saints, and of course there's the Virgin Mary, and I think so much of this, it kind of just depends what lens you see things through. A religious person might say that it was Mary or a saint who had come to visit them, someone who is less religious or maybe not Catholic, might be more likely to choose history to superimpose over this experience. And of course, sometimes you do just get a feeling. Though to me, I am pretty skeptical of this idea without anything to back it up. This idea that it's like, oh yeah, well, it was this woman who used to live on this land, etc. Because, I don't know, not everything has to be a ghost. And I'm not trying to say that everything... That's not a ghost as like an angel or something, but there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And also we all see things kind of through our own lens. So then Mitch Waxman also included the story of this man's tenant. So I wanted to read that as well. I'll probably just read some of it because it's pretty long. So my tenant stopped and asked me one day in front of the house. He asked me if we had a ghost living there, and before I told him, I asked him what he meant. He said he dreamt about a lady. I asked him to describe her, and he said her hair was done up in an old-fashioned bun, she was older, her hair was white, and she wore a dress that was cinched around the neck, the way they wore in earlier years. He also said that he had once peered outside the backyard window and saw someone looking up at him intently. He said it was a spirit guide. My tenant has told me he is sensitive to phenomenon. He even described meeting a woman and immediately knowing that the woman was pregnant. He in fact asked her and she said yes. That's a very risky prospect, asking someone if they were pregnant. But also I don't think it's an uncommon thing to know if people are pregnant without any other obvious clues. I think that's a pretty common thing. But then there's another story that's recounted that I wanted to read a bit from. I woke between 2 and 3 a.m., at least I felt like I was awake, and saw a kind of dark shadowy figure move slash walk from one side of the room toward the foot of the bed staring at me. Seemed like an older woman or a deadly looking middle-aged woman with long hair past shoulders staring me down as she crept toward the foot of the bed. She lowered down slowly as if she was going to go under the bed, but went out of sight at my feet. Almost instantly, I felt my feet tingle and I began to shake like I was shivering Then both legs entirely... The sentence ends there, but this is terrifying. Anyway, I tried to kick my legs to make it stop, but it only made it worse as my legs were basically shaking out of control, and whoosh, it went up my trunk to my neck, and my whole body was shaking, and my head flexed hard into the pillow. I called out for my girlfriend, but my face muscles were very tight. And then this person says, help me, and says that he felt wide awake, and then... I began to also feel a pull toward the bottom of the bed and toward the wall that the mirror was on. As soon as it felt like it was going to throw my body off the bed or across the room or through into the mirror, whoosh, it left down through my body and out of my feet, and it was standing at the foot of the bed, staring at me, smiling, slash kind of laughing at me, and turned toward the mirror and walked through. That's it. I was wide awake for two hours trying to contemplate if that really happened or what. Nothing like that has ever happened before or since. The only other thing that happened was a couple of weeks later, a glass picture frame seemed to jump off the wall and shatter it on the ground in the middle of the night at 3 or 4 a.m. The same day I put a second mirror up in that bedroom. So let's pause here. I have a couple of things to say about this story. One, it's terrifying. Two, I don't feel like this third story is the same entity as this benign lady, especially the the lady from the first story, where it was like she wasn't there physically, she was there to protect and watch over this family, etc. That seems so different from this terrifying final story, which I think describes not a woman in white, but like a hag. So... Let's go to Wikipedia again. Wikipedia calls this type of entity a night hag or an old hag. So to read from that, it's the name given to a supernatural creature commonly associated with the phenomenon of sleep paralysis. 
It is a phenomenon during which a person feels a presence of a supernatural malevolent being, which immobilizes the person as if sitting on their chest or the foot of the bed. Goes on to talk about how the word nightmare used to be used to describe this phenomenon, though now it has a general meaning of like a bad dream. But this to me describes the episode that that last story has, right? There's sleep paralysis. There's this terrifying older woman. She doesn't seem like a dignified or kind type of presence. She seems like a pretty scary hag who is causing this paralysis and sitting on this person's feet. And I just don't really feel like these entities are necessarily connected. So the newspaper, the Queen's Chronicle, reported on the supposed explanation for this lady in white. Though, like I said, I think there's more than one presence at work here. To read from that article, On this Eastern Astoria stretch, several residents have reported spotting a woman wearing a high-collared dress with her white hair in a bun. She's known as the White Lady of Astoria. Sometimes, according to those who have spotted her, she appears with a sick child, and witnesses often smell lavender when she's spotted. It goes on to say that the White Lady is believed to be a woman named Elizabeth Hallett. So here's what the Queen's Queen's Chronicle has to say about her. William Hallett, Hallett's third husband, purchased land in Astoria after he and Elizabeth fled from Connecticut because she had divorced her second husband due to his being insane. Insanity, though, wasn't a legal excuse for... For separation back then, so Elizabeth was technically guilty of polygamy, which was punishable by death. Hallett's descendants were later killed by slaves who were not allowed to go to church. It's believed the slayings were Queen's first capital murders. Um, the website Do NYC has this claim about the White Lady. This spirit, known as the White Lady of Astoria, was killed by her two slaves around 1705. Her house is said to haunt the 44th Street block to this day and can sometimes be spotted with another ghost-like figure of a small child. So I should have given a content warning before this, but this is the part of the episode where I'm going to be talking a little bit about chattel slavery and some of the evil stuff that happened here in Astoria. So first off, one thing that always sets off huge alarm bells in my head when I'm doing research is... This idea of a white slave owner being murdered by the humans who this person owns. I don't feel sympathetic to enslavers being murdered. I don't think it's controversial to say that. But when reading these stories, it's hard not to read them in a way that projects sympathy on these people who were killed in the course of someone trying to get their freedom from an evil system that didn't even view them as human. To me, there's no question of which thing is more evil, enslaving other human beings or killing someone because they have enslaved you. And I feel really frustrated by some of the language in this Queen's Chronicle article that says, you know, the Hallett descendants were killed by slaves who were not allowed to go to church because it posits that the killing was tied to something that we today might see as trivial, being allowed to go to church. Whereas it was much more likely tied to the fact that the people doing the killing were enslaved by the people who they killed. And I'm sorry if I'm belaboring this point. I was just very frustrated by the way that this was framed in a lot of the stuff I was reading. And I know that some people may debate this question of morality around killing someone who believes it's okay to enslave other people, etc. I know people may disagree with me, but let's talk again a little bit more about the dark history of slavery here in New York City. I talked about this some in some of the cemetery haunting episodes that I've done 
like the Trinity Church and St. Paul's Chapel episodes down in the financial district. So the reason why I felt like it was important to talk about the history of slavery in that area while talking about hauntings is because I believe that it is essential context when thinking about the history of an area, period, but especially the history of an area from a paranormal perspective. New York City, the city, its wealth, many of the large corporations today that make a lot of money in the city, particularly down in the financial district, it was built by enslaved people. Slavery in New York City existed until 1827, which, as I talked about in a previous episode, was way longer than many other places in the Northeast. There was even a literal slave market in the financial district at Wall Street and Pearl Street, which was open for 51 years and which sold Black people and Indigenous people of all genders and ages. And Astoria, like the rest of New York City, has its own history with slavery. Many of the wealthy families in the area, the families who I've talked about in previous episodes in particular, were slave owners. And also, I found a pretty disturbing bit of history in a book called History of Long Island City, New York, which was written by J.S. Kelly and published in 1896. And I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but this area, Astoria, is known by many different names, particularly historically. So Long Island City, Astoria, Newtown, they're all sort of used similarly in a lot of writing from this era. So when it's talking about Long Island City in this context, it's talking about the area of Astoria as well. So the book recounts how there was a position in the town of Newtown, which is this area, that was a common position in a lot of the various towns around the area in this part of Queens. And that position was Negro Whipper. In April of 1729, the town of Newtown appointed a man named William Tallier, or Tallier maybe, as General Whipper for the town. So I'm going to read a little bit from this book, and this is pretty rough. Besides being whipped, slaves were often branded in the forehead with a hot iron. So this was a thing that was not just legal, not just publicly done. It was a literal position you could have appointed by the municipality in which you lived, which if that's not evil, I don't know what is. So I'm going to continue reading from this book. On the night of January 24th, 1705, William Hallett Jr., wife and five children, were murdered by an Indian named Sam and a negress who were slaves of the family. The motive was to secure possession of the land. This extraordinary tragedy absorbed popular attention for a long time and was influential in legislation for the suppression of slave conspiracies. Speedy, though terrible punishment, awaited the perpetrators of the crime, who were burned at the stake at Jamaica, February 2nd, 1708. So that's the story of the Hallets as told by this book. So some accounts say that they were murdered for the trivial act of not letting enslaved people go to church. This story suggests that it was to acquire the land of the family, of the Hallett family. But like I said before, I don't know that I can recognize any motive aside from freedom in this case, right? Like if you're someone who's enslaved and you kill the person who has enslaved you, an important thing to remember when reading accounts like this is that the person writing it may not believe that slavery was a bad thing. So to them, they're like, oh, these people wanted land. But if you're not seeing someone as a human worthy of freedom, then of course you're going to make up some story that makes the person who was murdered look like a victim of someone's greed, etc. But 
in reality, people like the Hallets lived in a world where slavery was legal and encouraged and sanctioned and enabled by the state. And people like the Hallets had all the power, right? And if you need reminding of that, a little bit later in this book, there's this nostalgic passage that talks about you know, how the English and Dutch selected new homes in a new world and for generations lived there. And it paints this really nostalgic picture that I'm going to read a bit of. Domestic wants were simple and few and were readily supplied by industry. What was desired beyond home production was found across the river in New York. Purchasers thither went without money and in place thereof took along for exchange produce, tobacco, beer, and Negro boys. So literally, this book is reminiscing about the good old days when people didn't need money and could barter for goods, consumer products, with human children. So this is why I feel so frustrated when I read these stories about the white lady of Astoria and people are like, oh, it's this woman who is tragically killed by her slaves because it completely misses the point. You can easily make an argument from a paranormal perspective where it's like, well, why do you think it's this woman? What evidence do you have? Why do you think it might not be one of the other many people who have surely died in the area or some other entity entirely? Like maybe it was never a human entity. But from a historical standpoint, it's if you want to be charitable, it's very ignorant. Though, of course, you could be a lot less charitable in your reading of stories like this. But one thing that I did do when thinking about the story and researching the history of the area was I really was trying to find more information about people who were enslaved in this area and what their lives might have been like. And thus far, I haven't been very successful. But in my research, I found that John Jay College, which is a part of the City University of New York system, they have a database where you can search to find records of enslaved people and enslavers. And I went ahead and looked up the records for Newtown, Queens, which is, you know, like I said, kind of like pretty much present day Astoria. I found 11 pages of results featuring a bunch of familiar names who I've talked about before. And I will say, not all records are tagged correctly. And some records have typos or different spellings in their tags. So I think that the numbers I was looking at here were very much artificially underrepresenting the number of people who were enslaved in this area. So take the stuff with a grain of salt and kind of like the families I'm talking about and the numbers of people enslaved in this area that I'm talking about, you should think of it as like there were at least this many people enslaved in the area, but there were probably many, many more. And I wish that I could highlight the stories of enslaved people rather than just kind of doing what I did, which was making a sort of inventory of enslavers and the number of humans they owned, I basically went through the records and looked for families and people who I may have mentioned previously and flagged any last names I recognize and that I know I've talked about before. So the records of people who were enslaved are extremely incomplete. For example, when I searched for enslaved people's records in Newtown, Queens, I only got four results and only three of them had names attached. There was someone named Tom who was born in 1754 and enslaved by a man named Charles Grant. There was someone named Nero, no birth year listed, enslaved by a man named William Garden. And there was an Andrew, no birth year, enslaved by a man named Andrew Springsteen. They have no last names. Andrew's information comes from the records of the New York Manumission Society. And while I can't read the manuscript that it came from because it's handwritten and written crossed, which makes it totally illegible to me at least, I'm really hoping that his inclusion in that record maybe means that he was freed at one point because that's what the society's goals were, though I am not sure. 
And I want to try to continue to do some digging to see what I can find out about people who were enslaved in this area. But the records I found started in 1735 with the record of an enslaved person who was unnamed, who was owned by a man named Paul Burtis. Like I said, in most of these records, only the enslavers' names were listed. So let's talk about some of the families I've discussed in past episodes, or in this episode, who were enslavers. And of course, the Hallett family are among them. But let's start alphabetically with the Alsop family, who I have talked about before. We've got a 1790 record of a woman named Abigail Alsop who owned eight humans. It sounds like the household was made up of 10 non-enslaved people and eight enslaved people, though it's unclear to me how many, if any, of the non-enslaved people may have been household servants rather than enslavers. In the 1810 census, John Alsop is listed as owning four enslaved people. So you may recognize the Alsop name from the episodes that I did about Calvary Cemetery because the family once owned a farm where Calvary Cemetery stands today. And their family cemetery is actually inside Calvary Cemetery. I found it a month or so ago. It's a weird little family cemetery tucked into a chain link fence in the middle of the separate larger Catholic Calvary Cemetery. From what I could tell, the headstones in the cemetery only marked the graves of the slave-owning family members. I'm not sure where the enslaved people in the household were buried. I want to dig into that a little bit more. So then there's the Berrien family, who I've talked about before. I've talked about the Berrien family cemeteries, which have been demolished. And also the Berrien's had an island named after them, which is now connected to the mainland, and is the site of a Con Edison power plant. In the 1810 census, there's an entry for Cornelius Berrien, who owned four enslaved people. Now we have the Blackwell family. You'll recognize the Blackwells from many past episodes. They used to own Blackwell's Island, now called Roosevelt Island, the former site of the New York Lunatic Asylum and the current site of the ruins of the old Renwick Smallpox Hospital. So in 1810, there is a record of two Blackwell households, enslaving one person per household. There's not an earlier record than that, at least tagged with Newtown for the Blackwell family, though I'm sure they owned humans prior to that. Next up, we've got the Hallett family. So I couldn't find the numbers from the early 1700s, which is maybe when Elizabeth Hallett was supposedly killed, though I found some later census numbers The 1790 census shows seven Hallett households, owning between one and eight enslaved people each for a total of 21 people who were enslaved by the Halletts of Newtown, Queens in 1790. And of course, I've been talking about the Hallett family a lot this episode, but you probably also recognize the Hallett family name from Hallett's Cove and Hallett's Point which are geographical areas near here, which I've mentioned many times. You have a great view of Blackwell's Island or, you know, now Roosevelt Island and the lighthouse that I've talked about before from both Hallett's Cove and Hallett's Point. They're a family whose names are still around and well-known in the area today. So now we've got the Lawrence family of Sarah Lawrence fame, though I also talked about the family cemetery which still stands near the North Shore of Astoria. That's one of the cemeteries I've talked about that is in a person's backyard. So according to the 1790 census, each of their households held between one and nine enslaved people. And in 1810, there were three Lawrence households, each enslaving between two and four people. So now we've got the Moore family, who enslaved between one and eight people per household in 1790. In 1810, there were six more households, each enslaving between one and six people. I talked about the Moore family in some detail in the Moore Jackson Cemetery episode. I don't think I've mentioned this, but I have been told by folks associated with the cemetery that there was a case of a murder in the Moore household. And I believe the story is somewhat similar to the Hallett story, where it was people who were enslaved by the Moors 
who killed one or more of the Moore household, though I haven't yet had a chance to confirm that story and do further research, though I will eventually. So next up, we've got the Rapelli family, who I've mentioned in a bunch of my episodes that I talked about the local history in. So the Rapellis enslaved between one and seven people per household in 1790. And in 1810, there were seven Rapelli households, each enslaving between one and five people. Then there's the Riker family. I talked about them in the Riker Lent Smith Cemetery episodes. In 1790, Jacobus Riker owned seven humans. And in 1810, there were two Riker households, one of which enslaved three people, one of which enslaved five people. Side note, there was also a 1790 entry for a slave-owning person with the surname Lint, though the name was spelt differently from how I usually see it spelled when I read about the Riker Lint Smith homestead and cemetery. So I'm not sure if it was the same Lint or not. My guess is that it is, though, because there are variations in spelling for almost all the names I've mentioned here. However, in 1810, there's a correctly spelled entry for a Lint household that enslaved three people. So I know it's maybe not the most interesting thing in the world to listen to a laundry list of families in an area and census records, but I wanted to make sure to talk about this. One, because I've been remiss in not thinking to look up the records of the families previously, as I've I've mentioned them in the past. I should have thought to look up whether there was a database where I could search and see what their history was with regards to slavery. So I wanted to make sure to correct that. Also, I do think that there is something to be said for seeing just this like list of people who they're the people who got to be remembered in the area. And there's just page after page of names of these enslavers, right? Like these are people whose names still live on our maps. And there's this history that is not buried isn't maybe the right word, because I think it probably is safe to assume that any like wealthy landowning households in New York during a certain time period probably did enslave people. But still, there is something very stark about looking at the actual records. And like I've mentioned in previous episodes, it's weird how sometimes places aren't haunted by the things you think they should be haunted by, right? Just like when I talked about Lower Manhattan, why are there so many nameless people who have suffered and died? And then it's the wealthy people who got to be remembered, the people who did the torturing, the enslaving, etc., who stole land and then enslaved the people who lived there, etc. Because while there were many people of African descent who were enslaved in America, there were also a lot of people who were indigenous who were enslaved here. And I feel like that kind of gets left out of the narrative some too. And like I said before in the episode about Trinity Church and St. Paul's Chapel. To me, when I see this, when I see that the people who are considered ghosts or whose stories get overlaid onto the stories of ghosts, and I think about how they're the people who are remembered in our history, it makes me feel like the ghost stories aren't real. Or at the very least, like the conclusions aren't correct. Because if so many other people have suffered and died in an area, why is it that the only people who come back as ghosts are rich and are the people who, if you were searching in a history of an area, you would find their name, right? It's a little bit too convenient. And I think it is important to think about the ways in which there's this lazy storytelling. You know, I I think that What's so interesting to me about paranormal investigation is the idea that you might uncover a story that wasn't told before or communicate with someone or something you haven't encountered in other research. And to me, it's always very disappointing when there's a story that gets this pat explanation. 
Right? It's like, oh, well, this woman was killed or she died here or whatever. And so she must be the person haunting it, forgetting all the other people it could be if it's even a person, right? If an entity exists, that's a big if. And then it's a big logical leap, I think, to assume that an entity was once a living human. So I would love to hear what people think about this topic, in particular, what people think about the idea of the stories of famous residents of an area getting grafted on to people's paranormal encounters in an area. You know, am I the only person who finds that extremely suspect? Probably not. Probably a lot of folks would agree with me on that. But I'm definitely curious to hear what people think. So that's what I wanted to cover this episode, just starting to take a look at both the paranormal side of this neighborhood that I love, Astoria, but also looking at the terrible things in its history. So next week, I have some more weird ghost stories about homes in the area. I've got a couple different hauntings and haunted houses here that I found in newspaper archives. And I don't know if I'll get to these next week, but I've also found other interesting stories about the sort of thing that hauntings are often associated with, right? I found a really interesting murder story in Astoria from 1909. I have been doing some research trying to ascertain whether there were potentially smugglers tunnels or other kind of strange things like that. I found some stories about a sanitarium in Astoria that was once in the same area where a lot of these stories come from in old Astoria. And I've also found a story about a decrepit cemetery that no longer exists. That was like the town cemetery. So there are a lot of ghost stories and paranormal stories from the area. And there's also a lot of things that people claim might cause hauntings. So you can look out for the next episode the week after next. And before I say goodbye for now, I did want to mention, since this is such a Astoria-focused episode, the elections are coming up here in New York, or at least the primaries. They are on June 22nd, I believe. And if you live in the area of Astoria, or if you know anyone who lives here, I would encourage you to vote for Tiffany Caban for city council. I have talked about her previously, especially in the context of talking about Rikers Island and talking about the power plants in the area. You know, they call this area Asthma Alley because there are so many power plants here. It's really bad for the air quality. That's a big issue for her. You know, making sure that we're focusing our energies on green power, not just because it's good for the environment, but also because there are parts of this neighborhood where the air quality is bad enough that it is unpleasant to breathe, let's say. And I've known people who've lived near the power plants and have had a lot of respiratory issues. So that's a big issue for her. Also, Rikers Island is part of her district and part of the district that I live in. And I've talked before about how most people in Rikers Island have not been convicted of a crime and are just waiting for their court date. And many people end up waiting there for years while being exploited for cheap labor, slave labor, you might say. And Rikers Island is considered one of the world's largest penal colonies, right? So Tiffany Caban is a decarceral candidate, and one of her issues is shutting down Rikers Island as soon as humanly possible. So I believe that early voting will have started by the time this episode drops. If you live in the area, if you know anyone who lives in the area, please vote or ask them to vote for Tiffany Caban or I think now that it's ranked choice ballots, rank her as number one on your ballot for District 22 for city council. And 
If you live in the neighboring district, District 26, there's a really great candidate for city council on the ballot named Jonathan Bailey, who I would highly encourage you to rank number one. I've literally seen him around campaigning. Actually, the other day I was over by Calvary Cemetery and I saw him and a bunch of his volunteers. So he's a really great candidate as well. All right. I know this has been a really long episode. If if you've listened all the way to the end, thank you. I'll post the sources for this episode as well as the rest of the show notes at buriedsecretspodcast.com. You can follow me on Instagram at buriedsecretspodcast. You can write to me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. And thanks so much for listening.